Thank you. Good evening. My name is Anthony Galasso, and I am a Kevin B. Harrington Student Ambassador. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College, I'd like to welcome you and thank you for joining us for tonight's event with United States Senator Jeff Flake. The Institute's mission is to educate, engage, and empower citizens of all ages to actively participate in the civic and political life of their communities and to strengthen democracy. The Institute is nonpartisan and does not endorse political issues or candidates. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask that you now please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen DeSalvo, President of St. Anselm College. Thank you, Anthony. Good evening. Welcome to the New Hampshire Institute of Politics at St. Anselm College. It's great to have everybody back here again. As many of you know, New Hampshire has a long tradition of political and civic engagement, and we are always very happy to take part in this process. It is my pleasure tonight to welcome United States Senator Jeff Flake from Arizona. Senator Flake was first elected to the Senate in 2013 and previously served six terms in the House of Representatives. As a member of the United States Senate, Senator Flake sits on the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, the Foreign Relations Committee, and as you know, the Judiciary Committee. Recently, he authored Conscience of a Conservative, a Rejection of Destructive Politics and a Return to Principle, which has been described by the New York Times and others as a thoughtful defense of traditional conservatism. Prior to entering politics, the senator served as executive director of the Goldwater Institute, where he worked to promote a conservative philosophy of less, more freedom, and individual responsibility. Senator Flake is a dual graduate of Brigham Young University, where he earned his bachelor's and master's degrees. He and his wife, Cheryl, who's here with us tonight, currently live in Mesa, Arizona, and have five children. We are very glad the senator could be here tonight, given how busy his last few days, few hours, and few minutes have been. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming United States Senator Jeff Flake. Thank you all. Dr. DeSalvo, Executive Director Levesque, thanks for having me here at the Institute of Politics. And uh, thanks, thanks to all of you, really, for being here. It's great to be in New Hampshire again with my wife, Cheryl. I've always heard that St. Anselm is a safe place, <laughs> populated <laughs> by calm, reasonable people. <laughs> I'm counting on this today. <laughs> You have no idea. <laughs> I only re regret that there isn't very much to talk about right now. But, but seriously, and to be clear, when I titled this speech, After the Deluge, I meant that metaphorically. <laughs> I hadn't counted on an actual deluge. <laughs> so a uh, teachable moment here. Be careful what you title things, because it makes them happen. Use your words responsibly. When I first started thinking about this speech and how to frame it, I thought about calling it, What Happened to Ronald Reagan's Party? President Reagan's party was once brimming with ideas, full of purpose and principle. It was coherent and inspiring and idealistic. So much so that it awakened the imagination of a kid from Snowflake, Arizona, and a whole generation of other kids just like it. It made us think of big thoughts of our place in the world and of what it meant to be an American in America, the shining city on a hill. Reagan's vision of America as the indispensable nation was benevolent and big-hearted. 
a beacon to the striver and to the oppressed. And those locked behind an ideological wall that divided the world into the free and, to the, and the oppressed. It was morning in Reagan's America. It wasn't perfect, but it was always getting better. It wasn't endless bounty, but by grace and grit, there was enough for everybody. We were the sum of our goodness, not our gripes, of our resolve, not our resentments. And in Reagan's America, we knew where the buck stopped. Now you can't find that poor buck. It's wandering out there, searching for someone, anyone, to claim responsibility. And President Reagan, even during his most intense partisan battles, he both comported himself with dignity and accorded his opponents the respect he felt for them. the dignity that he felt that they deserved. You know, just like we see in Washington today. <laughs> but let's return to the present deluge of our own creation, because the only way we'll get through this period is being honest about it, and by resisting the cheap impulse to find stalking horses for the damage we ourselves are inflicting. What is it the kids say? That when you point a finger, you have three pointing back at you. Even the wisdom of the playground is somehow lost on Washington these days. Governing is hard. Democracy is hard. Decency shouldn't be that hard. But it apparently is. You know what's easy? Being callous, being a demagogue, the politics of vengeance, that's easy. Dehumanization requires very little talent. By raging at each other with our minds vacant of reason and reeling with ill will and conspiracy theories, we Republicans have given in to the terrible tribal impulse that first mistakes our opponents for our enemies. And then we become seized with the conviction that we must destroy that enemy, seemingly oblivious to the fact that not, not only are we not enemies, we are each vital organs in the same body. It's as if in order to save ourselves, our brains decide to destroy our hearts. That's about the level of care that we're currently bringing to the proceedings. That's about how smart we seem to be right now. We are harming ourselves, seemingly without regard to who else we might take down with us or what institutions we plunder. There is a sickness in our system and we've infected the whole country with it. And that was just last week. <laughs> last week, on the day before the Senate Judiciary Committee was to meet and hear the testimony of Christine Ford and Brett Kavanaugh, on the Senate floor, I gave a speech exhorting my colleagues to listen with open minds to the testimony that we were about to hear and to resist the impulse to strip Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh of their humanity and to turn them into mere props for our politics. It surely is a symptom of our disease that such a modest plea was met with rage from all sides. It was an interesting experiment actually, like dipping a toe into a pool of piranhas. And just as piranhas are unthinking killing machines, so too can ideologues be unthinking and dangerous. The left was enraged because I had failed to behave exactly as they wanted me to behave. They wanted me to prejudice the testimony against Brett Kavanaugh. The right was enraged because I had similarly failed to prejudice the testimony against Christine Ford. I had failed my tribe. I've been failing my tribe for some time now. Well, by the ways that we measure political success in this sordid era, and by the conventions of how party loyalists are supposed to behave, I hope to continue to fail my tribe. I would encourage us all across the political spectrum to take the same risk. 
Step out of your tribe. Do something hard and start a dialogue that you might never have started before. And that uh, our current, current tribal rules simply don't allow. From personal experience, I can attest that it's never too late to leave the tribe. To self-styled, smash-mouth, tough, tough guy politicians, bipartisanship has become sort of a mushy word. It isn't viscerally satisfying to people who always have to have their way the way two-year-olds must have their way. No offense to two-year-olds. <laughs> but they have no business in elected office. Anyone who studies history knows that we have been at our best as a country when we've been at our best as a country, we've been our most prosperous and our most principled. We've done the hard work that our constitutional system was designed to do, and we have compromised. Throughout our history, consequential moments have gone in search of statesmen and stateswomen. And to our great good fortune, these moments have almost always found them. Our country itself was a compromise, and our system of representative democracy would not exist but for one of the most grand compromises of all time. But, stop the presses, we are not always at our best. And anyone who studies history knows that ours is a country that has literally come apart at the seams once due to tribalism. Our country was once almost dissolved over its differences. There are some days in Washington when it feels we are lurching toward dissolution again. And yet, in our short lifespan, the United States has become the most successful and principled and generous civilizations ever known. And America became unique in the history of nations, not in spite of our differences, but because of them. The accommodation of differences is, of course, what democracy is and does. But that is a lesson we forget and relearn on more or less a constant basis. We divide ourselves when we divide ourselves into shirts and skins and relish the perverse satisfactions of destructive partisan tribalism, we fare less well. My message here today is that tribalism is ruining us. It is tearing our country apart. It is no way for sane adults to act. And most importantly, ultimately, the only tribe to which any of us owes allegiance is the American tribe. The only way we will chart a course out of our present disaster is by resolutely failing the tribes that we have fallen into. The tribes that have separated us as Americans and turned us against each other. By rejecting the binary model of democracy and doing things differently, than we have done them in the past. By partnering with our opponents, appreciating the goodness in them, by choosing a different path than the path of bitter partisan advantage and the dopamine rush of scoring cheap political points. When I last had the privilege of speaking here, I framed my talk around the refrain, we will get through this, and when we do, I went on to describe a future beyond this moment, beyond this presidency, a future in which we repair the damage of this period, and one that we strength, where we strengthen the foundation so that our politics might never succumb to the base and tribal impulses again. But before we get there, we must navigate our way out of here. And in order to see the future, we must understand the past and see how it led us here. Our current crisis has many fathers, but my generation has done its fair share to refine this brand of poisonous politics. In my time in Cong Congress, I've seen this deterioration up close. In January of 2011, just a few days after Democratic Congresswoman Gabby Giffords was shot and gravely wounded as she greeted constituents out of a, outside of a t Tucson supermarket, we in the Arizona congressional delegation left an empty seat for her in that year's State of the Union address. That year, 
the delegation made it a point to sit together in solidarity rather than divide along party lines as the rest of the chamber typically does during that speech. One year later, when Gabby, who was working very hard at rehabilitation, uh, returned to Congress, I sat next to her during the State of the Union address. During President Obama's applause lines, Gabby wanted to stand up, but was unable to do so on her own, so I helped her up. That left me standing, <laughs> the lone Republican, <laughs> in a sea of cheering Democrats. <laughs> During and after the President's address, <laughs> during and after the President's address, I received furious text messages and emails from partisans who wanted to know why I agreed with President Obama. <laughs> While I like and respect President Obama very much, I disagreed with a lot of that speech. But Gabby Gifford was my friend, and it was my honor to help her that night. It was a gesture of affection for a cherished and brave colleague. I, haven't given, I hadn't given it much more thought. It certainly didn't occur to me that I should worry about what other Republicans might think, because life is too short to worry about things like that. In that moment, we weren't members of political parties. We were friends, fellow Arizonans, fellow Americans, fellow human beings. And yet, all that some people could see was that I was somehow consorting with the enemy. Much the same happened in the late summer of 2016 on that day when my Democratic colleague from Virginia, Tim Kaine, was selected and added to the Democratic ticket as a vice presidential nominee. Tim and I entered the Senate together. We obviously disagree on many things, but I know him to be an exceptionally smart, hardworking, and patriotic senator. By way of congratulating Tim on being named to the Democratic ticket, I tweeted a playful jab, now trying to count the ways I hate Tim Kaine. <laughs> Drawing a blank. Congrats to a good man and a good friend. Once again, there was remarkable, unhinged fury from the ideologues. At a political gathering not long afterwards, I received a scolding from a diehard Republican who felt that I was, again, aiding and abetting the enemy. If you can't say anything bad, he said, don't, and he caught himself, <laughs> before fully reversing the advice I'm sure that his mother always gave him. Such is the conditioned response of a shattered politics. Now, six years after Congresswoman Gabby Giffords was shot, I found myself in an eerily familiar setting a hospital waiting room, listening as doctors described the critical condition of another colleague, Congressman Steve Scalise, who was fighting for his life after receiving a large caliber gunshot wound to the hip. Four other victims were being treated for gunshot wounds on other floors and at different hospitals. It was early in the morning of June 2017 this one hit even closer to home. We'd all been practicing for one of the rare moments of civility in Washington, the congressional baseball game, when a crazed gunman opened fire. Arriving back at the Capitol that morning in a daze, I navigated my way across the marble floors of the Russell Building to the Senate gym in my steel baseball cleats because my gear was still in the dugout, which by then was a crime scene. As I changed out of my uniform, the red stains on my pant leg and my blood-soaked batting glove, which was used to apply pressure to injuries, reminded me of how fortunate I was. To discover later that the motive had been political was shocking. The gunman looked out on the ball field and saw something other than a couple dozen middle-aged men playing baseball. He saw the enemy. It seems elementary to have to form this thought, much less speak these words, but here we are. I'm a proud conservative and lifelong Republican. That does not make Democrats my enemies. America has too many real enemies 
to indulge such nonsense. We ill serve our constituents when our tribal impulses take over and we cease to have a human response to each other. When we have governed best, we have sought comity and consensus. We fight and argue vigorously for our positions and our principles, but with the understanding that politics that endure are always with the imprint from both sides. That is when America is at her best. If it sounds like I'm calling for a new politics, it's because I am. We simply cannot go on this way. There's a fellow down in Texas, a very funny guy, very liberal, back from a generation when Texas hadn't banned Democrats. <laughs> His name is Jim Hightower. Hightower had a stock saying that went, the only thing in the middle of the road is yellow stripes and dead armadillos. Like I said, he's a funny guy. But with all due respect to Mr. Hightower and those poor armadillos, I want to make it clear that what I'm talking about here is not the abandonment of conviction in deference to some kind of soft middle of the roadism. I'm not talking about surrendering beliefs or putting a finger to the wind to find out what your deeply held convictions are today or what they might be tomorrow. I'm a conservative Republican, and that's borne out by any objective measure or grading system that exists. And my friend Chris Coons, the senator from Delaware, is a liberal Democrat. Incidentally, when I say that Senator Coons is my friend, I don't mean it in that syrupy way that uh, people call each other my dear friend in Washington while gouging each other's eyes out. <laughs> Chris is my dear friend. I'm grateful to know him. We're friends because we have worked together. And we've worked together because the constitutional framework that created our government ingeniously makes governing hard and compromise inevitable if we're doing it right. It makes me have to consider what's best for the people of Delaware just as it makes Chris responsive to what's pe best to the, for the people of Arizona. And it's when we try and avoid compromise and take partisan advantage and do things because we have the numbers, especially when we are as terribly and closely divided as we are now, that we begin to do serious damage to the country. I don't want to get too much into it here, but the compromise that Chris and I struck on Friday is one that I take seriously. And we did it because fairness required us to do it. And we did it because in that moment, our impulse to tribalism was tearing the country apart. In order for the results we come to to make sense for the country, we all have to have a process that we can have faith in. I, for one, I'm waiting for the additional information that will come from the supplemental FBI investigation to inform my decision on Judge Kavanaugh's nomination. Now, for the past year, I've been speaking about the condition of our, of our democracy because my conscience has required me to do it. Our institutions have been under assault. The independence of our justice system has been threatened our doctrine of separation of powers has been tested like seldom before. And the stability of the world has become an open question as the administration upends the post-war world order that we created and that has kept us safe for more than 70 years. I didn't go to Washington expecting to have to defend the basic institutions of American liberty. I didn't expect to find myself in vain against the President of the United States especially the president of my own party. I went to Washington to reduce the size and scope of government and the reach of Washington's sometimes suffocating effect on the American economy, to reduce taxes and regulation, to unleash the full potential and great societal benefit of American capitalism. I went to Washington to work on expanding America's markets through vigorous free trade, and to see that we had a robust, secure, and welcoming immigration policy. 
I went to Washington to challenge my ideological opposites, to learn from them, to make friends, and to compromise when necessary for the common good. Because none of our problems can be solved by just one party, by just one tribe. The kind of thinking, that kind of thinking is a recipe for our current disaster. It has unleashed all of our worst impulses and has brought us to the brink. And until we solve the problem of our politics and stop warring with each other and imperiling our democracy, the issues I went to Washington to work on will be impossible to address. We've got to make it so that indulgence in tribalism at the expense of what's good for the country will be punished at the ballot box. We must change our political culture so that when you come to destroy and not to build, you will pay a political price. And we've got to reward compromise again because compromise is the rock upon which we were founded. If you want to make America great as an elected official, be humble, conduct yourself in good faith, and when necessary, compromise to find solutions. If the past week has taught me anything, it is that this country is hungry for us to work together again on their behalf. Uh, just a few hours ago, I was interviewed in Boston before a crowd of a few thousand people at the Forbes 30 Under 30 event. The moderator joked that sometimes it looks like I'm a man without a country. <laughs> Truth is, I sometimes feel like I'm a man temporarily without a party. But I've got a country, thank you. The same wonderful country I've always had. It's that same country that makes me think whenever I travel overseas and come back again of the poem by the 19th century poet Henry Van Dyke, and I'll close with this. He wrote, "'Tis fine to see the old world and travel up and down among the shining palaces and cities of renown to admire the crumbling castles and the statues of the kings. But now I think I've had enough of antiquated things." <laughs> so it's, so it's home again and home again, America for me. I want the ship that's westward bound to plow the rolling sea. To the blessed land of room enough beyond the ocean bars, where the air is full of sunlight and the flag is full of stars. May we always remember that in this blessed land of room enough, there is room enough for all of us regardless of your political party. Thank you so much, St. Anselm, for all of you for being here. I'm grateful for your invitation.